three, two. Could Tom Allen be out of his way of Bloomington after all of this? You are Locked On Hoosiers, your daily podcast on the Indiana Hoosiers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Locked on Hoosiers. I'm your host, as always, Jacob Rood. I want to thank you guys for making us your first listen every single day. I uh, want to thank uh, our sponsor today, Sling TV, because this episode of Locked on Hoosiers is brought to you by Sling TV. Don't miss this week's matchups, uh, conference title matchups, right here on Sling. Sling, the TV you love. For a price you'll love, try it today. There's a lot going on with IU Athletics across the board. Uh, So I thought I'd bring in a a special guest, um, current managing editor over at Crimson Quarry, the old stomping grounds over there, L.C. Norton. Uh, But it is a a wild time for IU Athletics. Uh, How are you enjoying uh, everything going on on campus down there? It's, well, some of it's fun, others of other things are not as fun, a bit more painful, uh, just like not ideal to watch. I mean, two top 10 basketball programs, got to be happy about that. But also the football program after a lot of success is kind of on a downward spiral. So, yeah. And that's what we're going to start off with. We're going to start with the bad, finish with the uh, with the good. But IU football is in a, an interesting place um, and it doesn't interesting is about as nice as I can put it. I think it is not a particularly great place on Tuesday. Um, a report came out from Chris Vanini of the athletic talking about potential, uh, replacements for Liberty, uh, head coach vacancy, Hugh freeze, obviously going to Auburn. And interestingly, Tom Allen's name was one of the first ones that was mentioned. Uh, obviously, his buyout on Indiana's end is massive, about twenty million dollars, but the buyout on Tom Allen's end drops to about or to four million dollars on Thursday. Uh, so, if he wanted to leave to go to Liberty, it would money would not be a hurdle. Now, obviously, the caveat there is, I don't know that any Big Ten coach is going to want to leave the big 10 to go to Liberty, but, um, and the links there are kind of tenuous. It's mainly that him and Hugh freeze spent time at various jobs together, Arkansas state, Ole Miss. Uh, but still it's interesting. And it's a name that Vanini said sources, industry sources, whatever weight you want to put on that have mentioned, uh, Tom Allen's name is one to watch. What was your reaction when you saw that today? So, I generally like it was like an interesting like, huh, all right, interesting, because that's the only name I've seen him linked to from the Nini's articles at the Athletic, um, because, I mean, South Florida became, came up and a lot of people were like, mm, Tom Allen, uh, but didn't really see him as a candidate there. Um, I don't see I wouldn't put much stock in it um, because this is home for Tom Allen, like he's from Indiana, like USF became, became an option because Tom Allen lived there. Like, I don't think he's ever really lived in Virginia or would call that place home. I mean, you have to, Liberty's looking for a very specific kind of guy. It just so happened that Hugh Freeze happened to be that kind of guy while also not being that kind of guy. Um, And yeah. I'm not a thousand percent sure Tom Allen fits that bill. Definitely a religious guy, but, and Liberty would be the one, one of the few like group of five, I guess now jobs that could foot the bill for a guy like Tom Allen to like maybe entice him out of a big 10 contract, but this is home for Tom Allen. I feel like he wouldn't feel great about leaving. I mean, it would have to come down to a money issue. I think if anything, uh, cause Tom Allen has a pretty substantial contract in terms of IU football. Uh, but I wouldn't put much stock in it. I mean, definitely like a name to watch. So don't like completely dismiss it, but I wouldn't like, I wouldn't think about it before I go to bed. Yeah, and that's kind of where I stand. It was interesting his name was mentioned, but it right now it's just kind of interesting. Um, 
I don't think things are so bad there uh, at Indiana with him right now that he would seek leaving basically. And as you said, there's a lot of money he would leave on the table. Uh, Hugh Freeze would have to, or excuse me, Liberty would have to really give him a contract that really made it worthwhile, I think. And as much money as they may have now, it'd be tough to give that kind of contract to Tom Allen, especially after the the back-to-back seasons he's had an IU. And that's kind of what I, I the general point I wanted to talk about with, with IU football is just kind of the state of this program and where they're at kind of heading into an offseason with, with a lot of uncertainty. I'll start off first. I mean, was 2020, 2022, do you think an improvement off 2021? So yes and no. Numerically, four wins is better than two, but realistically, three of those wins were last second stuff. I mean, the Illinois yeah. win was Indiana pretty much full strength against a team that had multiple months to prepare for. So it took a last minute drive to win that game against what ended up being a very, very good defense, a pretty good Illinois team at the end of the day. And then, I mean, they almost lost to Western Kentucky. Like this was a, this was very close to being a one and 11 team rather than a four and seven team or whatever the math, however the math works out. I mean, the Michigan state game, even that, like that was so many things had to happen for that game to win. Like, yeah, Indiana won that game, but also Michigan state lost that game. They made some questionable decisions down the stretch that they they should have won that game. Like none of the games that they won really stood out as like, oh yeah, this is definitely a win, except for Idaho. And even Idaho, they really didn't have a game plan for rain in the first half. So that was kind of concerning. Um, but yeah, this purely numerically, four wins better than two, but I don't realistically think this team is a whole lot better than last year's team. Uh, that was just honestly my takeaway as far as like if this team improved at all the the record was better the vibes were better at the end of the season at least but that's all i can definitively say was better about this team than last year's team and it, it's wild we're we're at this place i i'm regular listeners would have heard various preview episodes we did where kind of opposing fan bases were shocked that Tom Allen was I never said he was really on the hot seat but I made it clear that things weren't going great here with him and they were shocked to see that because two years ago uh, he signed that huge contract that (laughs) it's probably going to keep him here so I mean should we still believe in Tom Allen I mean it's not really much of a choice there just because unless he chooses to leave which we went over that a bit um that would be like what 20 over 20 million dollars in even after next season i mean it's going to be the tom allen show in bloomington for a while you don't have much of a choice but to like hope but as far as like believing in him um he's made the right decisions in the past he's made a few pretty not good ones that have got that's gotten in the end of where it is now um the jury's kind of out on him he i feel like all the goodwill he built up from 2019 and 2020 is pretty much gone i mean if it wasn't last season everyone was like okay there's a ton of injuries there's excuses this season all that goodwill is definitely gone but and if you look at the recruiting that he's done since those seasons i mean last season's class was good but this season's class not so great um there's just not much of a reason to believe like, oh yeah, this is going to get better. Last season, you could say, okay, lowest of the low, starting to walk on two walk-ons in the last two games, in the last game. Uh, And this season, it's like, I don't really see how it gets better. Like, I don't see a tangible way for this team to rise up because that's, they've proven what they are at this point. They're, there's not a lot of room for optimism, and you can see the names starting to enter the transfer portal uh, this week. IU has three quarterbacks in the transfer portal, uh, with Connor Bazelak doing so on Tuesday, joining Jack Tuttle, obviously, Grant Grimmel did at the beginning of the week, uh, and then Charles Campbell is the other big name in the transfer portal, at least as we're recording this, and... I mean, that starts to raise kind of red flags right away because we don't know the extent of Dexter Williams' injury, and it certainly doesn't seem like a thing that he's going to be able to quickly recover from. You hope so, but 
suddenly you're heading into like spring camp and potentially fall camp with three scholarship quarterbacks and and one of them is physically unable to take the field. I would imagine IU is going to get into the transfer portal again, but what's kind of the selling point there? Because it seems like Dexter Williams is the guy they want to go with. Are you going to go get somebody and tell them we're going to need for you to prepare the whole off season as a starter, but we don't think you're the starter. It's a tricky situation. I guess where does IU go now heading into the offseason? There's there are exciting pieces that they can hopefully keep, but how do you kind of balance that and what this team is is looking like heading into the offseason? So going into the offseason, Tom Allen just has a lot on his plate. Um I wrote a column earlier that he has to give up play calling duties because uh we saw we saw a lot of grief from Ohio State fans with Ryan Day, who obviously calls their offense because I mean, that just stretches a coach so fit thin. You, like, being a defensive coordinator and a head coach, that's two full-time jobs. Tom Allen has all the energy in the world, but he is still, at the end of the day, one guy. Um, he brought in Kay Womack. That was eventually his defensive coordinator. He kind of, like, brought him along, got him familiar with his system. And from all signs point to, like, him doing maybe something similar with Chad Will, he's never outright said it, and Tom Allen would absolutely would not, given the way he's treated like, oh, this quarterback might start. But I feel like he might – he he seemed receptive to eventually handing off play calling dues at the key. Has to if he wants to have any hope at all of retaining control of the situation. And then the quarterback question is an interesting one because Tom said – late uh yeah like that actually after purdue like yeah we want to go to a mobile quarterback going forward and really the guys who entered the portal were not that i mean grant gremmel he was a walk-on he's probably pursuing just playing time elsewhere kind of like jack tuttle did i mean connor bay's like we saw how mobile he was i mean jack tuttle uh he he could run which we hadn't really seen before uh but yeah. he had a lot of he had some speed to him when he got into the game against penn state before he had injured uh but it's a mobile quarterback moving forward. Brendan Soresby, the probably the number one quarterback in the depth chart right now. Um, and <laughs> what a, a, bit, what a wild, uh, wild couple months it is. But you're right; he probably is. And I mean, you ha- you might find someone in the transfer portal. It's going to be a very, very difficult question. They had a mobile quarterback who's now playing wide receiver. Um, it's, but also something to consider was like the team. As far as the starting quarterback went, the team really, really, really loves Jack Tuttle. He was a captain for a reason, and it might have rubbed some of them the wrong way that he was not the starting quarterback out of the gate um, because, I mean, he brought – like, but if you're going to have an offensive line like Indiana, you you have to work with it this season at least. You can't just, like, hope for the best, throw a not mobile guy behind it. Um, you have to have someone mobile back there because, yeah, he might want to, like, a drop back pass or to, like, carve up a defense – you're not going to have that with this offensive line. You have to adapt. And Indiana did not realize that until literally the last game of the season, um, and, which is far too late. We don't know when we'll see Dexter William again. Allen obviously said he wants a mobile quarterback. Um, he has his work cut out for him. If you've taken a look at the recruiting, I mean, they have nine commits, which is tied for Wisconsin, which literally didn't have a head coach until like a few days ago, which not great. Um, and even on top of that, their rate it's the worst rated class in the Big Ten, which is a departure from last season. And I really need to emphasize there is no guarantee that last season's really, really good recruiting class, there's no guarantee those guys are going to stick around. I mean, they have the portal now. Tom Allen has said multiple times that it's a difficult factor because now you have to recruit your roster as opposed to the guys you just ha- you just go out there and recruit. You have to recruit guys that are already on the roster. And Tom has said that enough to make me think, oh, that might be a worrying factor. And we're seeing it right now with the transfer portal. No big future pieces have really entered it yet but that could happen yeah yet is the is the big word there and it's worrisome uh i said during the season that i didn't really want to talk about if deshaun mccullough would leave or if Jalen lucas would leave just because i wanted to enjoy them because it it seems like it could be a possibility in today's college football and we'll see if that's the case uh again knock on wood it's not but it's just a, a wild fall that we've seen IU take for football in inside of two years. I, I think it's been less than two years since that win over Wisconsin, which ultimately is probably going to go down as the high point of, of Tom Allen's tenure. And to get to where we are now is 
it in some ways it's it's inexplicable like it's it's wild to to have fallen this far so it, it might get worse before it gets better uh we'll we'll kind of keep updated throughout the off season as more and more guys enter the portal and, and so on but now that we got the bad news out of the way, let's talk about some fun IU athletics teams and the women's and men's basketball teams. Before we do that, though, I want to give a quick shout out to Bet Online. They are your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. They already have a lineup for tonight's um, IU North Carolina game. IU is a six and a half point favorite. Uh, this UNC team is a little beaten up. And a little bruised and battered, and I like IU minus six and a half in that one. Um, the Hoosiers playing at home in these big matchups tends to lead to some uh, some routes, especially against UNC in recent years. So if you guys want to jump in on that action, head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. Thanks again, guys, for making Locked On Hoosiers your first listen today. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports today. Uh, the biggest stories in sports they have you guys covered with. Uh, it's available on this app, YouTube, wherever you guys are listening to your favorite podcast app. The women's basketball team is uh, a lot more fun this year, even if the biggest story surrounding them right now is not particularly a fun one. Grace Berger, we mentioned in Tuesday's show, uh, out indefinitely, it was weird wording that she's like kind of day to day. She's taking her recovery day to day. Uh, IU was pretty vague about this last year when Mackenzie Holmes was injured, so I'm not surprised that um, they're kind of treating this the same. I guess the big question is, how does IU cope without Grace Berger for the foreseeable future? So my take on that situation, obviously, we're probably not going to hear like anything specific about the injury or like a specific timeline because that's just how IU rolls and we have to deal with it. But as far as coping, I think IU will be fine. Um, like definitely a lot better when she's out there. But if there's anything to be said about Indiana under Terry Moran, it's how they adjust both in games and just broadly around the season. So like you can see it in the game, whenever the Hoosiers are in trouble, Moran will call a timeout and boom, like the problem seems to be solved. That happens so much more often than not. And I mean, remember Indiana lost Mackenzie Holmes last year and they inserted counter bound to the starting lineup. Brown didn't bring a lot offensively. She was good defensively and Indiana found ways to win. They found ways to win without their leading scorer. And I think they should be fine. They have enough depth. Really, that depth is kind of what they're losing more than Grace because Grace is a fantastic player, one of the best players in women's college basketball. But I think they can replace that production. It's more of, okay, you're using one of the pieces, good pieces that was on the bench that was replacing her now to just full-on replace her until she's back. Um, which, I mean, yeah, well, a worrying factor Indiana has been fine without death before. They proved it last season. Like they can win. They're a lot better when they do have death, a lot better, but they can win without a ton of depth. And that's really the problem that I think Grace Berger's injury creates. The depth is the big difference, I think, between this year's team and last year's. Uh, but the big thing that is going to help them is Mackenzie Holmes, who has been otherworldly to start this season. 20 points per game. Seven and a half rebounds, but she is shooting 76.6%. In seven games, she has attempted 77 shots. She has only missed 18 of them. She has been absolutely phenomenal. Of those 18, four of them are threes. So she's averaging two missed two-pointers per game on 11 attempts per game. It's absurd what she is doing. How big is she going to be now? We saw last season when McKenzie went down, Grace stepped up, the hats on or the shoes on the other foot, I guess now. How big is she going to be? Holmes is just otherworldly. Like, oh my gosh. And what I want to say here is this is the McKenzie Holmes Indiana needs if it really wants to go where it really, really yeah. wants to go. Um, especially now that she has shooters like Scalia around her. And I mean, you know, Parrish can knock down a few, Chloe Morrill can knock down a few. That just creates more room for her as people are drawn out to the perimeter. I mean, Holmes is just like her development. Like she's gotten so much better over the years. She was really good last year. Very, very good. She seems even better this year. And I mean, you really need a player like that if you want to win the Big Ten, like what I was doing. And she's just going to be 
I mean, if she's all right throughout the season, uh, she, that Indiana can go places because of the things that home is doing right now. Like, oh my goodness, they haven't really been in trouble this season. I mean, that could change against UNC. I'm not sure yet. Uh, but Holmes is just like automatic. You pass it down low. She's got you. There aren't going to be many games this year where she's not like definitively the best player on the floor. And that's been the case so far this season. And uh, Thursday will be the first test of that. There are any number of role players that we've kind of mentioned um, to this point in this season that have stepped up in various ways. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it to you first. Who's kind of stood out to you the most in terms of some of those uh, various role players in that depth that IU has? So, I mean, the name you have to bring up first when you're not talking about like the big stars or Indiana starters. I mean, she started a few games, but Garzon. Like, oh, yeah. Yarden Garzon is going to be one of the best players in the Big Ten, depending on how long she sticks around. I mean, oh, my goodness. Like, she's a nightmare matchup. I mean, she has the size of Mackenzie Holmes, and she can handle the ball like a guard. That's nightmare material. And she can shoot it. There is There are so many things that she can do, and there are few players who can defend all of that. I mean, it's bonkers. I mean, she, and she's just a freshman. She's going to keep getting better. She's probably going to get better throughout the season. She's going to get better the longer she's at IU. I mean, she came here at a good time. Like, she's very good on an incredible team, but Indiana's future looks so good with her. And beyond her, I mean, Sydney Parrish, I mean, she's willing to drive to the basket, shoot, handle the ball more. She has no fear that she just plays with no fear, like the way, mm-hmm. like, she's like willing to dive for a ball. Like there is nothing that intimidates Sydney Parrish and she does a lot of things. Well, it's not like she's a one trick pony. She does so, so many things so well. And then, I mean, Sarah Scalia, she is what this offense needed. I mean, they didn't really have a true shooter last year. Like, yeah, NCH could knock down a few Ali Pepper had a few moments, but they didn't have someone who you're like, okay, she has the ball. She's going to shoot it. That's Sarah Scalia. She's lights out as a shooter. And she, on top of just having the three, like she really provides what Holmes needs down low. I mean, she just makes this team so much better. And then Chloe Moore McNeil, I think it's difficult to name a better example of Indiana women's basketball the past few years, a good player than Chloe Moore McNeil. I mean, she bided her time in the bench. She was a contributor off of it and she was really good last year. And this is undoubtedly, she is a better player this year. I mean, Mm -hmm. oh my goodness. She has just developed over time and that's really I feel I feel as though that's really Terry Terry Morin's trademark for the program. Like she will develop players. You will go through Indiana and you will get significantly better. Even if people didn't think you could get better, like Holmes is really good last year. She's even better this year. Like she will like Indiana will find a way to make you better. And that's so true of Chloe McNeil. She's and we've talked a lot about her and that development with Chloe. And you can just look back to last season at this point. Uh, kind of that NC State game where she she didn't play much. Uh, she in she stepped up in a big way when Mackenzie Holmes went down, uh, and then was a, a big time impactful player by tournament time. And then, like you said, you look at this year and she is uh, she can do a bit of everything and is a really important piece for Indiana. I can't get over how good Yarden goes on is. Um, out of nowhere, and you you could see the quotes after her uh, first game of the year where she scores 19 points in her debut, and um, I can't remember who had it. I think it might have been Grace that said, like, we realized real quick when she stepped on campus that she wasn't a normal freshman. And so to see her – I mean, she had a big weekend in Vegas. We didn't really talk about the games when we talked about what happened in Vegas earlier this week. Uh, but she had 21 points against Auburn, 17 against Memphis. Uh, another person that if with Grace going down, she's the type of person that could theoretically step up. But it, it's going to be similar to what it was last season where it was kind of a committee effort uh, to replace McKenzie. It's going to be a committee effort, uh, whether it's Sarah, whether it's Sydney, whether it's Chloe. Um, this team has a lot more depth and – it's going to be tested. You're going to lose some of that depth now, but um, they they should be able to absorb this loss, knock on wood. And hopefully Grace will be able to get back out there by the end of the season because if you can get Grace back out there with how this team was playing, I think you have a legitimate shot at a Final Four. The, the latest ESPN Bracketology had IU as a one seed. 
Uh, it's still November, so I'm not going to put a ton into that yet, but that's how good this team, that's what this ceiling of this team is. So hoping for the best for Grace and she's able to get back out there, but this is still a, a really good team that's going to play a, a really good UNC team on Thursday. We talked about that on Tuesday's show with Isaac Shade of Locked on Tar Heels, so be sure you guys check that out. Let's wrap up with the men's basketball team. Uh, obviously, you guys know about their big game tonight. Uh, we'll give some of our thoughts on this game and the team so far here in just a moment. So IU really has its first challenge. Uh, maybe not its first challenge. The, the, the Xavier game was a challenge. It's the biggest challenge so far, I would say, with this UNC game tonight. What's kind of your thoughts on, on what this IU team looks like uh, heading into this game? Because ultimately, they've only had that Xavier game to, to kind of test them so far. Um, they passed the test, but it's been a lot of really bad teams since then. What's kind of your thoughts heading into this game tonight? So just a few things there. This season so far, it's been a lot of Trace Jackson Davis and Xavier Johnson, which sounds a lot like last season, um, which a bit of a concerning thing. But, I mean, again, like you said, it's November. Um, still early. I expect things to change down the stretch. But this is still just a much more efficient team with much better depth and spacing than it was last year. And then um, as far as worries about being untested, um, I don't really wouldn't worry about that too much because I mean, Xavier was a tough one. And I mean, Mike Woodson, he treats every matchup like it's the national championship. I mean, you watch that man on the sideline, he'll have a double digit lead against some like random school and he'll look, it'll look like his team is out there fighting for his life. He'll have his hands at his head. He'll be yelling and be like, Mike, you, you have a 20 point lead against like Bethan Cookman. Like you're, you're good man. But no, he, and he stresses that on his players, like, hey, um, do not take any of these guys for granted. Like, we need to play every day as though we're playing the best team in the country. And that's the right kind of mindset to have. I mean, a uh, team takes on the personality of its head coach. And, I mean, if anything, that's very, very good for Indiana because nobody's getting past Mike Woodson. Nobody is sh – like, he's not overlooking anybody. It's – it wasn't even this kind of untested idea it wasn't really something I thought about until I just kind of looked at their Ken Palm uh, schedule getting ready for this week. And I mean, it does stick out that they've their best outside of Xavier, the best team they've played is Moorhead state. At the same time they've beaten the brakes off everybody they've played as well. So like, it's not like these are close games or they're, they're absolutely handling these teams. Um, and yeah, then UNC had issues against like the same kind of teams that Indiana was destroying. So yeah, exactly. So and that's what we talked about with Isaac yesterday is that they only beat Gardner Webb by six, and that's a team that's not that much better than Moorhead State. Uh, they were struggling with Portland stuff like that. So this UNC game though is going to kick off. <laughs> They're going to be tested by the end of the, uh, the next three weeks or so. There are a couple things that I think are a little bit concerning. Uh, starting with the three-point shooting, it, it's. I think this is going to be a question that we're going to have about IU probably all the way through the tournament. Is uh, is their three-point shooting going to show up? Where do you stand on what this team has done so far? Is it still, or how much of a concern is it for you? So as far as threes. We all knew it would be an issue, and the good news about that is so did Indiana itself. So, I mean, Woodson should have a plan if the shots don't fall. So I think having two ball handlers helps guys like Cop get just, like, have an open look. I mean, he just has to knock them down. He he hasn't been, like, super reliable, but he hasn't been, like, that bad at hitting those threes. Um, and they've got to take more efficient shots. I mean, no long twos that they kind of have gotten away with so far as, like, Xavier and Jalen Shafino have both gotten away with some law twos. Like those just aren't efficient. It's fine when you're playing like Bethune Cookman and Moorhead State. It will not be fine when you are playing Ohio State, Michigan, Illinois, what have you. Um, and I'm gonna borrow some wordplay from Miller Cop. Um, Whitson had to squeeze what shooting he could out of the guys he had uh, to borrow from Cop. It's like reading a towel. Sometimes it works well and you get a lot out of it. Sometimes it really doesn't, and you're not gonna get a lot out of it. Yeah. Um, that's just the way Indiana is built this year. There's not much that can be done about it right now. Um, I don't think Indiana, I think Indiana is a better shooting team than they were last season because 
they had two just open corner three guys and that just was not great. Um, I mean, you're not going to get a lot of motion in that kind of offense. Um, having two ball handlers really, really helps that. I thought you were about ready to pull a Miller cop and drop some random phrase in here from his uh, press conferences that he did. I can't remember what the phrase was exactly that uh, he was challenged by race Thompson to put into the uh, press conference, but uh, marinating chicken. That's what it was. Uh, <laughs> I thought we were going to get one of those dropped in here, but um, I, the three point shooting, like you said, there's a number of things that I think um, make me worry less about it. The two ball handlers is a big one. Last season, it was Trace in the post, one guy that could get to the rim, and everybody else was just largely just standing around the perimeter. That's not the case this year. Uh, and there's a number of guys that are improved at, at kind of getting to the rim and being driving kick guys. And then just simple kind of progression. I, I think Trey Galloway has looked better shooting threes. Um, Miller Cop ha has looked great so far. Tamar Bates, especially the most recent game, looked good. Um, Jordan Geronimo. I mean, these guys ha have looked better and, and that helps as well. The other thing that a little bit of concern with, with noting that there's very little sample size here is when you look at the one test I, you had against Xavier trace and <laughs> trace and Xavier Johnson, uh, did just about everything Malik chipped in there. And then there were a lot of other people that kind of no showed. We've talked a lot about the depth this IU team has, but is it concerning at all that in their biggest test so far, that depth just kind of disappeared? I, and I wouldn't be too worried about that just cause I mean, the one thing I would say there is Woodson is constantly telling Xavier like, Hey, here's, there's pieces around you. You don't have to do it yourself. And he ended up having to do it himself with TJD. So, I mean, that was a bit of a concern, but I mean, it's still early in the season. I mean, I know this is like an experienced roster that has a lot of time playing together under their belts. Um, however, they still have new pieces that kind of need to gel and mesh and like get used to an environment like that. Like for a significant amount of players, like that was their first like road environment. They're like still settling in. Like I expect, I mean, it's a long season, only November. I wouldn't worry too much about that. I mean, it's notable that they're able to beat beat Xavier with just those two being like the true contributors. Um, I mean, once the rest of the bench comes along in the second lineup, really starts showing up. I mean, think about what this team can do. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be worried too much about it right now. If it's a problem that persists, like if it happens against, if it happens against UNC, I'd read some questions because they're at home and it keeps happening. That's when I'd worry, but um, I would expect some progress. Um, I wouldn't be too worried about it at this very moment in time. Sometimes you just need to kind of grit your teeth and grind it out and, and get the win whatever way necessary. And at the end of the day or at the end of the season, I should say, we could look back on that Xavier game and and that's how we look at it. Um, if that's just kind of a one-off, um, Trace and Xavier had to carry us that night, that would be ideal. And that's what I think ultimately this will be. But until we get a larger sample size, um, it, it's hard to tell. Tonight will be the first of that. I mean, and then really going into the weekend and once Big Ten play starts, like we're going to we're going to figure out right away over the next two or three weeks uh, what this IU team is made of and whether the depth is real, whether the three point shooting is reliable, all of that uh, fun stuff. Appreciate you coming on today. That'll wrap it up for us. Other people know where they can find you and your work at. Yeah. Um, so I'm at Biles St. Norton on Twitter. I'm at Crimson Quarry. Um, so you can find my work at Crimson Quarry. That's where most of my work is. Um, yeah, that's just about it for me. I used to be at the IDS. I have some older articles there. I wrote a big profile on Basilak when he first committed back this past spring. Plugged it a lot early in the season, not so much in the latter half. Um, and, <laughs> I mean, that's where you can find me. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, yeah no problem. And go check out Crimson Quarry. A lot of the people uh, that I bring on here, uh, I met through there and, and always love the, the work done over there. Thanks again to you guys for making Locked on Hoosiers your first listen every day. We'll be back with you tomorrow to recap the, the men's basketball game and get you the last preparations for the women's game. For your next listen, check out the Locked on Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. 
follow us on Twitter if you have not already, um, at LO underscore Hoosiers. Subscribe to the podcast, leave a rating and review, all of that great stuff. But most importantly, though, guys, uh, go Hoosiers in their big test tonight. And as always, LEO.